question that I would like to explore today, tentatively, is how did liberals perceive, feel, and think about reality? How did they construe the world they encountered? What kind of sensibility did they forge in the critical period in which modern liberalism was born? I take it that uh, liberalism in American life has always been something more than a political ideology, narrowly conceived. It has provided not only a language and a set of political values, but also equipment for perceiving reality, a way of feeling, a set of ontological, aesthetic, and moral commitments. So when I speak of a sensibility in this way, what I mean then is a collectively held, unified, and integrated pattern of perceiving, thinking, and feeling. And that's what I'm going to try to sort of talk about liberalism in those terms. And in doing so, I want to stress an interpretive point that runs counter, I think, to much of the historiography, the historiography on liberalism of this era. Ever since Hofstetter's age of reform, it's been a central convention to mark a fundamental distinction between the progressivism of the early 20th century and the New Deal liberalism of the 1930s in a way that speaks very much to this issue of cultural sensibility. For Hofstetter, the distinction was between progressive moralism rooted in Protestant notions of moral order in 19th century individualism, and New Deal pragmatism, committed to a scientific and experimental ethos liberated from an outdated and didactic morality. For Gary Gerstel, writing some 40 years after Hofstetter, the distinction uh, is a different one, but nevertheless there's a sharp distinction between uh, uh, progressivism and uh, New, Deal, New Deal liberalism, and it's a distinction between a culturalist progressivism concerned with the preservation and, di and direction of ethnic and collective group values, and an econ economistic New Deal liberalism uh, concerned with using state power to address issues of economic disorder, labor, and consumer rights. I find neither of these distinctions entirely compelling. Uh, Rather, moralism and scientism, culturalism and ec economism, and whatever one, one wants to call that, run throughout the liberalism of this, this entire period. So I want to look at this period as a piece uh, from 1890 to 1941. And again, with all dates, these are arbitrary uh, to a large degree. But, but, uh, but I, th I think uh, uh, World War II does provide a, an, an effective uh, breaking point. And I want to push beneath the surfaces of policy differences and differences in immediate political context and issue to look at the continuities of sensibility over this entire period. Uh, and I know that in doing so, what I'm going to do is diminish uh, and erase from my discussion the uh, uh, very important and significant policy difference, differences between the varieties of liberalism during this period. Uh, but, but, but so. So what I'm trying to do is, 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 is sort of look at this in, 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 in some, something of a broader context um, and, uh, and, and make some generalizations uh, that are, I'm sure, uh, uh, in, in many respects unwarranted when we look at differences that divide various liberals during this period. Uh, my starting point in this discussion is a well-known popular essay of William James's from 1898-99 uh, on a certain blindness in human beings. Now, James, uh, William James is not ordinarily identified with liberalism as a political ideology, at least in the way that, say, John Dewey is. Uh, in fact, his explicitly political writings, if one understands politics in the narrow sense as, uh, uh, as, as involving concrete issues, policy, and advocacy, uh, James did not write a great deal in that vein. Uh, but as a public intellectual and a central figure in the edu education of a generation of new liberals at Harvard, James had an immediate role in shaping the cultural dispositions of liberal spokespersons during this period. Most importantly, his writings stand as a signpost of a larger cultural shift. Their presumptions, dispositions, and methods of expressing thought and feeling can be found in the writings of this era. The sensibility that we find running through James's writings is, in this sense, a representative one. And I know, again, that's a contentious uh, uh, position. If uh, Dewey is the philosopher of a liberal democratic politics and society for the first half of the 20th century, James is really the philosopher of a liberal culture and psychology. Uh, and I would make that kind of distinction between James and Dewey on that point. Now, on a certain blindness in human beings is both a statement of the limits of human knowledge, especially <laughs> empirically derived knowledge, of the subjectivity of other persons, 
and a concomitant call for an ethics of liberal tolerance rooted in an understanding of that limitation. Precisely because, according to James, human beings are blind to one another's aspirations, meanings, and feelings, they are inclined to make judgments in which their own partial standards are elevated and erected as absolutes. The spectator, we might even say, and James doesn't say this, but we might call it, say, the empiricist, uh, sees only external conditions and evaluates them only in terms of standards derived from his or her own aspirations, meanings, and feelings. This empiricist or spectator, according to James, is blind, stupid, ignorant, intolerant. Uh, these are the terms he uses because uncomprehending. If only the spectator could feel and hence see the internal significance of material objects, human actions, and social practices different from his own, their peculiar and specific ideality is the term James uses, then he would cease his narrow judgment and embrace a more expansive and pluralistic one. James argues that the ideas people form of the significance of any object and the feelings they have towards that object are inseparable from one another, that pure reason can give us no standard for valuing one thing over another. Significance lies in the subjective attachment of feeling to thing, which is inaccessible. Now, in some ways, James's view is a kind of updating of classical liberal conceptions of atomistic individualism. If the social contract tradition associated with Hobbes and Locke imagined a state of nature in which sovereign individuals had claims to autonomy and property, but without recourse to a common standard to enforce those claims, James imagines a world of individual internal significances, of epistemological individuals, each knowing and feeling and seeing in his own way, but without recourse to a common frame of values and meaning. Autonomy of selfhood, for James, was not embedded in the externally recognized common form of property ownership, but in the internal world of meaning and significance, what we might call the property of feeling, as opposed to the property of, uh, of material good. Uh, older liberal thought through the mid-19th century had embraced both empiricism and an abstract formalistic conception of human nature. It used that formalistic conception of human nature to provide a universal epistemological and moral standard. According to this view, if all men were rational, then all would reason to the exact same truth. In other words, we could rely on this kind of subjective sense of rationality within all persons to come to a, 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 a statement that all could agree on. James's vision of multiple individual centers of consciousness negotiating the same spoke, same social space, but inaccessible to one another, provided no comparable standard. And as we know from James's psychological writings, he imagined that each of these individual subjective selves changed from moment to moment in the flux of experience, or had different form in relationship to changing social needs, hence the famous concept of the social self from this period that's picked up by various other uh, thinkers in this period. Um, so on the one hand, we have the subjective atomism of the unknown interior life of the individual, with the observer on the outside looking in and a barrier between self and others that cannot be crossed. We are blind, says James. We are blind to other people's interiority. On the other, we have a kind of fully socialized selfhood in which there is no sharp distinction between subjective and objective, internal and external. Uh, individual in society, but which in, in which personhood itself is a product of social experience. This an antinomy in James's conception was a central antinomy, I would say, in the emergent liberal sensibility of the era. The sense of spectatorship, alienation, apartness and sociological distance from ordinary life on the one hand, and the sense of an immersion in a world of fluid, uh, 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 open possibility where all distinctions and boundaries appear contingent and constraining on the other. 